Welcome to Next Round with the Pacific Research Institute. I'm your host, Rowena Ichon. In this podcast, our guest is Lord Jamie Boric of the United Kingdom's House of Lords. On January 31st, the UK made it official. It's separated from the European Union. Lord Boric, at a PRI luncheon in San Francisco last month, discusses all things Britain, Brexit, and Boris, and even Boric. He provides his perspective on the future of Britain after the EU, the possibilities of a free trade agreement with the U.S., Britain's national health care system, and even the new Prime Minister, Boris Johnson. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Um, to talk about uh, Brexit is a talk about a separation, and... Uh, separations from big com- big organizations have been historically really quite uh, quite good for the country who separates if you look at the American Revolution for example in the short term the Americans broke off with Great Britain who represented 80% odd of the trade of the 13 colonies that and did so without an, a deal without a deal for the uh, free trade thereafter it was only uh, when the Treaty of Paris happened I think about six six or eight years later, that we actually got proper trade between England and America. Now, we joined Europe in 1975, uh, possibly on a false premise that it was a trade organization rather than anything else, and it morphed over the intermediate period into a super state, which is where it is at the present stage. If you if you go back to a Frenchman called Jean Monnet, uh, writing in the 1950s, he laid all this out that this is what would happen: that you start, that you cannot invent a super state in Europe without frightening the people. But if you tell them that it is a trade organisation they will accept it. And then you make the trade organization more and more like a super state until, tra magically it is a super state. And you can continue to deny that it's a super state all the way through. And that's what they do now. The fact that it has a flag, it has a president, it has a money system, currency, it has uh, an anthem. Uh, are all things that make it look a bit like a super state. And uh, using the um, Jean Monnet argument, the purpose of it was to hold the balance of power in the world between the American super state and the Soviet super state. Now that's a little bit tricky if the Soviet super state doesn't exist any longer. So they carried on anyway. (coughs) And it, it served a certain purpose within British politics as being cover for difficult decisions by British Prime Ministers. And uh, Thatcher and Blair and Major and all the intermediate uh, ones, particularly Blair, Blair would stand at a lectern and take out his onion and sob that he really didn't want to do this, but Europe was making him, him do it. And it was all rubbish, but never mind. So a gradual amount of Euro scepticism grew in Britain and it was to squash that that David Cameron called the election and he was totally convinced that he was going to win all the way through it and he ran a campaign using the strapline of Britain greater in Europe which is an inherently pessimistic sort of tagline. If you look at the other side, the Vote Leave organisation which I was involved with, our main headline was Take Back Control which I think is a much more positive and it has a sort of ring of no taxation without representation. I want to look at the history of it. There was a very good BBC programme called The Uncivil War and it shows the power of Dominic Cummings, who was the chief executive of that campaign. Dominic Cumberbatch uh, played him, and uh, I recommend it's on the BBC website. Uh, To declare an interest, my son was the chief technology officer of that organisation, and we were really quite uh, quite closely involved in it. But at the end of it, as you know, Theresa May became the Prime Minister, and she was always a Remainer, and she pretended to be a, a Lever, and developed a thing which we called Rhino, having pinched it from you guys, Brexit in name only. (laughs) And the work that Theresa May did was to pretend to Brexit while remaining actually in the EU. Well, she had the election in 17, lost her uh, majority, and uh, the bottom of her career was in the European elections in the spring of 19, when the party's vote share went down to 9%, the lowest it has ever been. 
and she had to go, and we finally managed to get rid of her and elected <laughs> Boris. Well, to tell you a little bit about his character, he is a most extraordinary man. He is a thunderingly intelligent person, will, in the middle of a conversation, immediately pick out something that you have said and give you a classical allusion to, uh, to it. it. But he's a man who breaks rules because he understands the rules and doesn't really believe that the rules apply to him. Uh, uh, that's fine, but an interesting start for, for, for leadership. But he, he doesn't... And Margaret Thatcher said something about you've always got to start with beliefs. Uh, the beliefs are, have got to be the basis of your political career. And I'm not sure that actually that was true of Margaret Thatcher at the beginning. She wasn't much of a Thatcherite at the very beginning of her career in Parliament. We still had a 60% tax rate in 1987. So she had the principles but didn't show them. Boris is certainly not showing them. We know that he is a free market enthusiast, but he's not, didn't run this campaign on the basis of free market capitalism being the most perfect solution to the problem. He ran it on the basis of not being Jeremy Corbyn. And that was the main uh, uh, timing point of the election, because Corbyn is a man who makes uh, Sanders look like a Republican. Um, <laughs> Jeremy Corbyn is, uh, he, uh, he and his sidekick, John McDonald, came out with the uh, line that the Conservatives deserved to be punished for their misdeeds in the past, and that he, as Chancellor of the Exchequer, would make certain that the government's tax system punished the Conservatives. Well, I didn't really agree with him. <laughs> and uh, Corbyn came out with a campaign that um, was very much trying to uh, bribe the electorate. There's a Clarehue uh, short poem that is uh, well known in England, <coughs> which says, You cannot hope to bribe or twist, thank God, the British journalist. But knowing what the man will do unbribed, there's no occasion to. <laughs> and he tried to bribe the British electorate, and he totally failed. They just refused to accept the bribe. And we, that's how we got a majority of uh, 80, which is an overwhelming majority in, in Parliament. So we leave on the 31st of January at 11pm, uh, and there is 11 months to agree a free trade deal with the EU. This is what we call the transition period. And the EU has said, this is totally simple. All you have to do is accept all our regulations, uh, all our taxation systems, even the ones we change in the future, but you're not going to have a vote on them. And then we don't have any problems and differences between us, and we can have a completely free trade agreement. And we've said, that's like being a member. And, of course, the... Romaniacs are the people, that's the name we call the people who are so enthusiastic about remaining that they, they suffer from brexicosis. Um, <laughs> this is a disease of the brain that clearly rots them. Uh, they have already argued that this transition period should not be 11 months but should be five years long with the ability to extend it for even further. We think the solution to this is to agree a free trade agreement with uh, America, with Trump, uh, and do it fast, to do it this summer. <laughs> and then say to the EU, this is the skeleton of your deal, uh, or we'll leave on WTO terms, World Trade Organization terms. The key, of course, is that they sell far more to us than we sell to them. Large percentage of the car production of Stuttgart comes to the UK. And if you cut down the car production by about 20%, you cause very, very serious domestic problems in Germany. So, you know, it's not good to have a battle with your friends, but it's also not good if they try and bully us into having uh, all of their regulations without any, que uh, any question on them. So we may have a little bit of a difficult time with Europe, and therefore having a deal with America first will define the way that the deal with Europe is, um, is created. Now, a lot of people say that you can't do quick trade deals, and that's all of those people are lobbyists <coughs> who want to make certain that their particular niche is properly protected. One way of doing it, which was uh, proposed by Dan Hammond, who you may have spoken here in the, in the past, a friend of mine, it is to simply say that anything that is legal in your country is legal in our country. 
because you have got quite sufficient lawyers to make certain that what is going on in your country is safe. And uh, if a drug manufacturer has got something through the FDA, I think that's probably good enough for me in England. Similarly, your beef <coughs> is, according to the e Europeans, filled with hormones which used to be legal in the EU but are no longer uh, legal in the EU but they're used over here. It's really an artificial barrier. <coughs> and of course chickens, which gets me back to the uh, wonderful Pacific Research Institute, which was founded by Sir Anthony Fisher, Fisher with money that he made out of chickens. So <coughs> the, the way he did that um, was to use American chickens in London, in the, in the UK for the first time, <coughs> because the American chickens are altogether nicer beasts than the British chickens at the time, which were all fighting each other whenever put in small cages, but the American ones uh, seemed to get on with each other far better. Um, <coughs> and he made a fortune out of battery hens in the, in the UK, and he used it by founding the IEA and the Pacific Research Institute and other ones around the world. Because all of these things, these uh, are non-tariff barriers against free trade. And the solution may well be to just make certain that everything is properly um, labelled. You could label the chicken after a state in, in America. You could call it Kentucky chicken, perhaps. <laughs> I mean, the truth is, is that British tourists are told that chlorinated chicken, which is the washing of the chicken uh, as part of its processing in chlorinated water, is the, that, that is the most dreadful thing. The truth is, we wash our children in chlorinated water. It's called swimming pools. It is just a load of nonsense, and you will hear it. The most recent thing was we can do a deal with America, but not in respect of chlorinated chicken. Well, I've never seen a British tourist on the street corner wondering whether to go into Kentucky Fried Chicken because of these appalling... <laughs> and it would be very nice to get cheap American chickens and cheap American beef into the UK. And then the price, our cost of living in the UK would be substantially less than it is at the present stage. So looking forward to the advantages of free trade, uh, I can see a rather exciting year coming up and I'd be delighted to answer your question. So, um, why did the UK decide to, uh, or why didn't they go into the Europe? I mean, the Brexit is possible because you have the pound. That's not so possible for Greece or Italy. I mean, there'd be a little bit more of a work to do there. So, what was the... The was, did everybody hear that about the Europe? Uh, why didn't we go into the, into Europe? There are several reasons. It came up when the Labour Party was there, and there was a disagreement, we are told, between Blair and Gordon Brown. Blair wanted to take on the Euro, um, Gordon Brown didn't. And declaring my interest, I was treasurer of the Business for Sterling organisation, which was campaigning against it. And of course, people have a relationship with their currency, which is very, very close of their view of what sovereignty is. And the almighty dollar is a uh, metaphor for American power around the world um, and is a very stable currency. Well, the euro is based upon the false premise that you can create a <coughs> super state by giving it all uh, the same currency. Of course, the dollar didn't come in over the whole of the states until the Civil War, did it? There were other currencies around in, in America. So you formulated the country before you formulated the currency, whereas the Europeans are doing it the other way around. And they have fixed the exchange rate effectively with the economies of Greece and Germany. And they are changing over a period of time. And the euro is changing for more and more the advantage of the Germans and the disadvantage of other countries. So you have 50% unemployment rates under the age of 25 in Spain, in southern Italy, in Greece, and in some of the uh, uh, smaller Eastern European countries. And that's a very, very unstable position. So we argued that taking the euro would be a really big piece of, a piece of our sovereignty going away. 
and it certainly shouldn't take place. And the polling was heading towards 80% on the side of us uh, to refuse to have uh, the euro. And of course, yeah, I have argued that the mistake that the euro enthusiasts did was not to recommend against the euro, hold a referendum, and under those terms win it by 80%. Then the people would have said they had been asked and their opinion had been taken and we had kept the pact. One of the big things that happened in the big European uh, uh, referendum was everybody saying we haven't been asked about this about Europe for the last 40 years. <coughs> if they had asked on the euro and recommended against taking the euro, they would have, might have won the campaign, the big campaign uh, to, to have Brexit. But that's all speculation, so we don't know. But I certainly foresee at some stage the collapse of the euro as a currency. But always such big financial disasters take longer to happen than anybody expects and then happen quicker than they expect. I don't know whether it will take a year, five years, 20 years, but that is an unstable structure at the present stage. If you look at a euro banknote, and I always carry a few around just for the hell of it. Uh, well, they're only small ones, so they're not actually very good for paying for lunch. Um, every European euro banknote carries a prefix letter on the uh, serial number. And the prefix letter is a code for which country produced it. So that I can look at this five euro note and know that it comes from Portugal, this one comes from Spain, this one comes from Ireland, and this one from France. So it means that a consumer, as you can in America with which Federal Reserve branch produced a dollar, you can detect the difference between a Greek euro and a German euro. And at some stage, consumers in their change might prefer a German euro to a Greek euro. And now, then, with the speed of communication, gosh, I was refused trying to change the Greek euro into the euro. The, the, what will happen next is the European Central Bank will say, don't be silly, there's no difference at all between them. And that's the point at which it collapses, because that's clearly not true. And the whole of the effort will be put on to telling everybody that they're stupid, and the people will, will revolt against it. So that's my prediction of, of exactly how that Armageddon financial uh, uh, Armageddon happens. So if I knew what time, uh, uh, you, everybody could short the euro, but uh, you don't know what time, at time scale this, this has happened, and of course it might not even happen at all. What would you like to see and what do you think is going to happen uh, to solve the Northern Ireland issue? Well, it, it starts off with the fact that the devolution, the power sharing, uh, collapsed about three and a half years ago, but it was reformed uh, earlier at the end of last week. So we could see a more successful form of um, uh, governance in Northern Ireland than they have had for the last three years. That might make the situation slightly more stable. We don't know. The, one of the keys is that the history of Northern Ireland has been very split between the Catholics and the Protestants. And the world is getting more complicated. The younger people are less religious than they were in the past. We have more immigrants. The, the truth is that people are not so tribal now as they were before. And the number of people as a proportion used to be pretty overwhelmingly a Protestant uh, Northern Ireland, which is why it was split away from Southern Ireland in the first in 1922. I, I think that the demographics are changing to make that much, much more blurred. If you're looking in the long term, I would see that it's quite possible for Northern Ireland to join Southern Ireland, and then both of them to rejoin England to get out of the uh, EU. But, but, but Brexit is, is not a problem. Well, I mean, Northern Ireland has an enormous amount of its trade with Southern Ireland, but all the statistics are very, very confusing. For example, if you're an Irish entrepreneur and you take a container load of something from China, there's not a big container port in Southern Ireland. So your container comes 
uh, the big container ships have their big their routes, and they call in at Southampton, and then they go on to Hamburg. So your container going into Southern Ireland gets taken off its ship in Southampton, and the EU statistics department declare that that container is then exported from, Southern Ar- from England to Southern Ireland, so that the figures are completely haywire, because that container has never been opened in England. And similarly, and there's a lot of trading, of course, across the border. The countries are really pretty well connected uh, t- uh, together. So uh, the idea that Brexit will stop all trade is just an argument by the Romaniacs to frighten the rest of us. I don't believe it. Scotland? Well, Scotland, uh, Scotland is, a, is another case. Because of the Scottish Nationalist Party, they have been pushing Scotland away from England. I have a suspicion uh, that Scotland is not the most popular of organisations within the English. But this is not a question that you should ask the English whether to get rid of the Scots, because the answer might be quite clear. Uh, the question is whether or not you ask the Scots. And having had a once-in-a-generation their phrase, not ours, vote on the subject five years ago. Their answer was very clear. No, they wanted to stay part of the United Kingdom. Now, uh, Nicola Sturgeon wants to have another referendum. She has applied for one and she's been told, nope, you can't. You can have another one in another generation. Now, the Scottish National Party does have a certain strategic problem, uh, which is that their last leader has a court case Uh, due to his sexual problems coming up in the spring and it is possible that Sturgeon might be called as a witness in this in this uh, matter he is accused of rape of uh, molesting uh, women and a whole bunch of different crimes all of which he's pleaded not guilty to and we will see what happens as a result of that but that's going to be in uh, March or April and we'll see what happens uh, as to whether he is as innocent as he declares. So Nicholas Sturgeon says that the most recent election has resulted in a mandate for uh, another referendum on Scotland, even picking up Joe Swenson's seat from the yes. Lib Do you think that was really about that, or do you think there's some other reason? The election was a general election for the, for the MPs to represent the government of the United Kingdom. She may say that it means that she has a referendum, but that was not on the, on the voting um, slip. It, she says that it, that it implies a majority for a referendum. And certainly her Scottish National Party did very well among the MPs, and the Labour Party did extremely well, as badly out of, it, out of it. But I don't think that is a clear mandate for a uh, new referendum in Scotland. And in any event, it is laid down that it is a British decision, not a Scottish decision. And she argues, quite plausibly, uh, that Boris Johnson, by saying no, is actually making her argument stronger. But that's slightly the five-year-old who argues strongly if you say no to them. No to them. Uh, anyway, whether or not what will come out of that, I don't know. But I, I don't think there's not much appetite in the country for more referendums. The last time we had a referendum was, of course, in, uh, for, the, uh, for, for Brexit, and it's taken us three and a half years to actually get it. One of the delightful questions that was asked the uh, Scottish uh, nationalists was whether they would leave the United Kingdom without a deal. When arguing that Britain should not leave Europe without, without a deal, would they leave England without a deal? And that caused a bunch of harumphing and general changing of the subject as quickly as possible. <laughs> so, Jamie, um, National Health Service, 71 years old, um, it's, a, it's in terrible shape. You do allow private coverage in the UK, which Canada, of course, didn't allow. Yes. So, Boris said that he um, wants to put more money into the National Health Service. Um, what do you think that means? Or what about opening up the private um, part of the of Britain's health care? The NHS was said by, I think, Nigel Lawson as being the British equivalent of a religion. Uh, we are not a very religious country. I know that, that America is a much more religious country, but far more people go to church every week in America than do in the United Kingdom. In the United Kingdom, more Muslims go to the mosque every week than 
Christians go to church. So the substitute for religious for religion is to believe that the NHS is wonderful. Now, this requires a lot of other things that happen in religion, including miracles and saints. And people believe in it really, 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 really strongly. I have seen articles supplied by doctors about disasters that happen in the National Health Service. There's a case where somebody went in for an operation on his leg and they cut the wrong leg off. That's a fairly serious balls up, isn't it? And they interviewed the guy afterwards and he said, no, the NHS is wonderful. The nurses are fabulous. Well, you, you might have mentioned that they cut the wrong... Anyway, anyway it, it, there's a sort of feeling that the NHS can do no wrong. And that makes it a very difficult position for the Conservative Party to do. And Boris, quite rightly, did not address this. Because if you, if you have a battle about the NHS in the middle of the election, you're going to lose it. Lose the election as well as everything else. So that wasn't the right moment to have a battle. Have a battle. However, in the long term, the increasing costs and the relatively bad outcomes of the National Health Service relative to that elsewhere is something that we must address. I mean, the most effective Labour attack on the Conservatives uh, was an attack by Corbyn saying that uh, Boris's secret plan was to sell the NHS to Trump. <laughs> now, you might ask how much he bid, but uh, I mean, that is a ludicrous attack. But it worked, and people really believed in it. And I, uh, uh, you know, when you are dealing with a religion, it's very, very hard to know exactly which argument to use, and you don't use simple facts when you're arguing with a religion. How likely is it that the UK and the US will have a trade I think there's a pretty good... How likely is it that the UK and the US will have a trade agreement? I think there's, there's a very good chance. If you look, I mean, from my separated position. Trump is enthusiastic about trade, but is about free and fair trade. And he's concentrated more on fair than he has on free. And so that might be something to be said for a trade agreement before your next election. And certainly your fabulous uh, ambassador in London, Woody Johnson, who is doing an absolutely first-rate job, is pushing this hard and working tremendously hard, but we've got to get over chlorinated chicken and we've yeah. got to get over <laughs> the rest of the stuff. So as soon as possible, we want a trade agree free trade agreement with America. Yeah, free, free being important. Yeah, you have one question. Yeah, one question. Do you feel that the relationship between the UK and the EU can improve under the new leadership? Ursula von der Leyen, who comes from Germany and just was elected president? The question is, how will our relationship be? And our relationship will, in the long term, be great. We have done something which has been quite complicated, quite outrageous from the point of view of the Euro fanatics. We have possibly uh, said that the king has no clothes. You know, it's, it's a big, big deal from their point of view. Just as it was when America split from... Great Britain. But, you know, after six years we got the Treaty of Paris and everybody's back in, back being friends again. Thanks to uh, uh, some great work by your founding fathers to make friends again. And uh, so it's quite possible to do. And I've, uh, you know, when you're trade, the more people trade with each other, the more friendly they are. And the more they understand each other. And they may do, you know, disagree with each other on a whole range of different things. But that's, hey, that makes an opportunity for more trade, not less. Uh, so the such disagreements we can get over. One of the concerns that some people had about Brexit was that once Britain leaves the EU, the dominance of Germany is even greater on the continent. And so things like a European army, maybe the diminution of NATO, uh, may become more problematic from an American point of view. It was interesting that Trump called for Britain and Germany and France and NATO to help with relations with Iran. He didn't call on the EU to do it. Yeah. 
you make an extraordinarily important point, and it was the only thing that would have made me pause on Brexit was the position of Poland, of the Baltic nations, and the Nordic nations. Denmark and the others, there's, there's always been a tendency in the EU Council of Ministers for there to be disagreements between the uh, big countries, uh, Britain, France and Germany. And uh, when the dinosaurs fight, it's very wise for the small mammals to go and hide <laughs> until the dinosaurs knock seven bells out of each other. A and we're leaving that battle and quite a lot of the small countries are very worried about exactly the point that you have made, that they will be dom dominated. And uh, from my point of view, I feel guilty about that point, but my own country's matters are more important, I'm afraid, than my loyalty to Estonia and Latvia, which I've never even visited. We have shown a way out for them, the best thing they could possibly do for themselves is to leave the EU and follow us. And we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll trade with them and do great things with them. But it, it, it's a worry. Uh, it's a worry, and I do hope we can all behave properly over it. Please. Yes, the US at the moment is, is uh, pressuring the British government uh, not to use the EU as a proxy for Europe. And this is a pressuring the British government to use the Huawei 5G system throughout the UK. Um, MI5 says one thing and MI6 says the other. So, um, what do you think is going to happen? <laughs> Uh, the, sorry, the question is about the Chinese uh, telecoms provider, Hawaii, and whether or not they should be part of our 5G network. And there's some disagreement. The problem is fundamentally that it is extraordinarily complicated to make a 5G network. Because of the physics, they are much shorter range signals, so you need far more, as you all know far more uh, aerials than you had before, so that the cost of setting up such a system is very different than setting up a 3G or a 4G system. And it actually, people talk about it as a 5G system, but it comes in aerials and it comes in cables between the aerials and the center and in the processing system between the cells. And it is possible to think of a solution where Hawaii, who are using subsidized, it appears, uh, labor to make their stuff, uh, so it is a lot cheaper, that they make, for example, the aerials, but not the processing uh, computers which process the signals. So there is a clear-cut argument for not letting them anywhere near the 5G system, there's also an argument that says, let them do the aerials, uh, uh, but we keep the central controls uh, separate from them. And there's another thing to say, look, they're probably hacking into it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so is it going to make that much difference? Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, Lord Warwick, this is just a question about trade with post-Brexit uh, in the UK. Uh, do you see a short to medium term increase in trade between the old colonies such as Australia, Canada, other countries and the UK? Yes. The relationship between Britain and Australia and New Zealand was absolutely fine until we joined the EU and the EU insisted that we effectively drop the trade and we used to get a vast amount of our food, lamb, other food items from Australia and from New Zealand. And it's butter and other such things, and that all still exists as a trade, but it's very, very much less than it was 30 years ago in, in tonnage. And we should be trading around the world with anybody who can make the stuff cheaper. Now, you might be somebody who can tell the difference between our, uh, New Zealand butter and American butter in a blind tasting, but I jolly well can't. What I can do is tell the difference in price. That's what most consumers are looking. Uh, uh, we kept a very good friendship, and of course the Five Eyes security system works extraordinarily well with complete trust between our countries. But the trade, we have to apologize to Australia and to uh, 
uh, New Zealand and to all the old British Commonwealth and say, okay, I'm sorry about our flirtation with the Greeks and the Italians, but let's put that aside as a little unfortunate point and go back to where we were for a rather longer uh, relationship with our great friends in the old Commonwealth. I think that's a great point to end on. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Special thanks to Lord Jamie Boric. If you like this episode, please tell your friends and subscribe to PRI's podcast at iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or TuneIn. And please do us a favor and give us five stars. You can also listen to our podcast on PRI's YouTube page, youtube.com slash Pacific Research One. That's the number one. Thanks for listening. I'm Rowena Ichon. Hope you come back again for next round with PRI.